So I'll talk about the distributional impacts of the energy transition. Um, the title uh, is a bit uh, misleading. I'll talk about some other papers, but I will spend most of my time talking about this paper, the distributional impacts of real-time pricing, which is with Natalia Fabra, who might be here, and also a couple of students. Uh, so as you know, we have this energy transition underway, and even if you were not economists, you probably would have heard about this in the news. Everyone is talking about it. Uh, so we need to decarbonize our economy and stop using uh, fossil fuels uh, very generally. But the electricity sector is at least a place where we see some progress and where we have the technology to actually make it happen. Uh, as you know, governments are announcing, let's see how serious they are about it, but they are announcing left and right that they will decarbonize the economy by 2050. And the electricity sector, oftentimes, they have goals of decarbonizing the electricity sector much earlier. And for example, even the United States is claiming that they will decarbonize the grid by 2035. Uh, very unclear that this will actually happen. So there are some limits to decarbonization, decarbonization and basically it all boils down at how costly decarbonization will be and how unstable. And one thing that in the early literature we have worried about quite a bit is the fact that renewables are no, not, not on demand we basically get renewables whenever we get them. So um, that's what we call intermittency. Uh, typically, we used to think about the supply following demand. We produce whenever we have demand for electricity, but more and more it seems that demand should also drive start following supply and we should use electricity whenever it's available. And that would be, for example, when it's sunny um, as opposed to at night. The, the speed of the transition is also a challenge because even though now renewables are cheaper than many of the other alternatives, it's taking kind of quite a while to get it deployed. And it often encounters uh, some problems. Some of them might be siding, as you know, particularly in Catalonia, it's extremely controversial to build renewables, either because it affects the landscape or because you're putting a transmission line somewhere. So all of these challenges will kind of affect the ability uh, to do the transition. Extreme events also will not make it easy, but they will also uh, make the transition more valuable. So as we have these extreme events, we have to uh, put the grid under more extreme conditions and making demand more flexible should, should help. Uh, this is an important challenge. Uh, the fact that renewables are intermittent and that we are having more and more extreme outcomes in the grid, even when we have better batteries. Because at the end of the day, if the solution is to keep doing what we're doing and just solve it with batteries whenever they become available, it will be quite expensive. So the idea is to kind of make demand a bit more flexible, try to see if we can engage consumers into responding to, um, to the energy sector. This used to be very difficult, but the recent events of the natural gas crisis make it kind of much easier to convince consumers to start caring about the energy transition because as you know, a natural gas is very expensive and uh, the, the benefits from the energy transition are kind of increasing by the minute. So when we think about the energy transition, oftentimes we worry about bottlenecks that we might encounter as we try to decarbonize the economy. And one of them is the fact that the impact of this transition can be highly heterogeneous. Many of you will have heard about the yellow vest in France and how that movement prevented many of the policies that uh, were uh, to be put in place, uh, in particular, increasing the prices for, um, for diesel. Uh, in the electricity sector, we worry equally that some of these changes might actually hinder progress. And we see this quite a bit in the news now, even though the current crisis is the natural gas crisis, in the news, we hear about it as the electricity crisis and the energy transition crisis. So it's easy that the consumers not understanding what's happening behind the scenes will associate the very high prices that we are seeing today with this energy transition and push back against this, uh, this problem. The impacts can be uh, very uneven and we have seen this in California. So California has been one of the states that has installed solar panels uh, faster and there's been tremendous, tremendous growth both in terms of large scale solar in the desert of Nevada, like miles and miles of solar panels, but also solar panels in the home. And what we are seeing now 
is that these solar panels, which were subsidized, were put in place by a very high, house, high income household of California. So now there is kind of a pushback against solar panels in the homes, even though they had been so popular, because there is a realization that all those subsidies went to the people that already have a lot of income. Those same people that put the solar panels now are installing batteries so that they don't have to suffer blackouts when the forests in California are burning. So this makes the inequality of the whole process kind of double. They are getting the subsidies and on top of that, it's offering them protect, uh, protection in the presence of extreme events. This is particularly worrisome because the people who are most exposed to extreme events tend to be not the high income. So if you think about an extreme event and being at home without electricity, it will be much more dangerous if you live in a very poorly insulated home that was already very hot to begin with and that has uh, limited access to ventilated areas. So these are all things that we should worry about. Today, I will not be thinking about as dramatic impacts, but I wanted to emphasize that these are uh, things that we should worry about uh, going forward. There's a lot of role for market design and policy design, and I think this is where we can help a lot as economists to try to think about how alternative ways of organizing these markets can make some of these concerns less salient, can help mitigate some of these potential negative impacts that we might be worried about. So as an example, what will be the distributional impacts of doing things differently in the market or in terms of subsidies? Or for example, now with a very high price energy crisis, uh, how should we design the, the support to households that might suffer uh, energy uh, poverty? So I think more and more we should be spending time as economists in thinking about the safety net provisions. And what, what does economics have to say when we think about these extremely basic goods uh, that now uh, we can no longer take uh, for granted? Worrying about this is not just a matter of worrying about those who will suffer the most from this. But again, it can also impact the ability to move forward with this transition. If we just leave people out of it and we kind of leave them behind, there will be a lot of pushback and it will not look pretty either. So I think there is a lot of it that relates to distribution, but also a lot of it that relates to the ability uh, to, to have an efficient, efficient transition. So this is an example of a much more dramatic event. Uh, this was a, a cold snap in Texas last year, and there was a one week of uh, prices for electricity at $10,000 per megawatt hour. You might be hearing in the news, they are now in the 300s. So for an entire week, day and night, prices in Texas were $10,000. The reason is that the weather was so cold that the natural gas power plants could not get their natural gas even though it's Texas and it's sitting on top of a lot of fossil fuels, they couldn't use it. So supply was much, much, much lower than demand and the market no longer cleared. The crossing of supply and demand was not working and the prices were at the maximum, $10,000. Now what happens when the price is $10,000? Some reactionary economists, I would qualify them as reactionary economists, they went on the record saying that 10,000 was not large enough. It should have been 20,000 or 30,000, you know? But this is not how a market for a basic good works. People in Texas were actually dying from not being able to feed themselves properly. So at some point, there's a question of what do we do when there is extreme rationing and the market no longer clears? I thought Texas was extreme, but we might be half we might have to think about some of these issues in this winter in Spain and the rest of Europe. So I think there's a lot of value in getting excited about these difficult uh, topics. And as I mentioned, I think it's particularly important to keep the low income dimension in mind because prepar preparedness for this kind of event is coming. I already mentioned how people in California are putting batteries in their homes, but it's coming uh, for those who are already better off this is a very interesting project that I love. Santa Barbara is converting their schools into shelters that can provide electricity even when the grid fails. But as you might know, Santa Barbara might be top five uh, income uh, zip code in the US. So these kind of very cool things to protect consumers are happening probably where consumers need the least, the least protection. 
This is a, 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 just a piece of news from, from Europe. And as you know, Europe is now facing some worrisome trends where we have these extremely high gas prices. This is October, so it's already outdated. Prices are even higher. So it's something we should kind of be worried about and try to think again about this uh, low income dimension. So there are many questions to answer. I put here many, I will not overextend myself given that they would like to, to go a bit faster. But, but here you have a list of many things that we could worry about, many tools that we could use. So there are many tools from economics that can help here. One is theoretical modeling of markets with rationing, but there are also many empirical tools that we can use. The energy sector has plenty of data, many of it high frequency, so we can apply the latest techniques in econometrics to try to inform this, this debate. I also think mathematical programming tools, optimization tools are extremely valuable in this setting because um, the electricity sector is kind of a huge constraint optimization problem, I guess like any economics, and, and, and these tools can be super helpful. Uh, I liked actually, Juan Carlos, that you talked about my interdisciplinary group at MIT because I kind of did it a little bit under hiding because I was worried that it would make me look a little bit out there. Uh, and actually, I had this slide about the need to talk to other people when we think about these problems, and in particular, uh, more broadly, climate scientists, but in the case of the electricity sector engineers, we really need to have this conversation all the time, because any solution that we might think about rationing, it will have to involve some technology and some engineering. So this is kind of the, the, the bigger picture. I wanted to put some advertising that I just started now a project uh, to study the energy transition here in Barcelona. And I already have seen people in the team and it's been super exciting to start this and to do it here in Barcelona. But if you are interested in this topic, so this is something that I hope will produce some interesting outputs. So today I'll talk about three papers that look at different distributional issues, although they will not be nearly as dramatic as the ones I highlighted in this introduction. I guess with these three papers, I wanted to give you um, kind of an overview of many distributional issues that we can think about. The last paper that I'll talk about in more detail will be more about low income and high income households, but there are also other distributional aspects that can hinder the energy transition. And one, for example, is the distribution between producers and consumers. And that can be a source of conflict. So for example, the energy transition will not work if the low income are very much uh, hammered, but it will also probably not work if we are hammering the incumbents a lot because the incumbents will come up with ways to make it go a bit slower. So it's kind of a, a, a careful balance on how to make progress without getting into a, a bottleneck. I'll talk about these three papers briefly. So the first paper was focused on the distributional impact between industrial producers and residential producers. And this was going back to a debate, a hot debate that was present uh, in the early 2010s when Germany expanded the renewable power very massively. What Germany did is expand renewable power a lot, which reduced the price of electricity in the wholesale market substantially. However, um, the subsidies for renewables had to be paid in some way. And what Germany did is charge the consumers, the residential consumers for the subsidies, but not the industrial uh, producers, let's say the car manufacturers. So that got investigated in the European Union and they were wondering to which extent is this considered an industrial subsidy, which as you know, in the European Union, it's kind of a red flag. So the, the idea of the paper was to think about this uh, redistribution in some ways. You are taxing the residential households to expand renewables uh, and, uh, and with the implication that you're making electricity very cheap for industrial producers. And the question was to which extent can Ramsey pricing be a justification for this policy? So if you remember Ramsey taxation, the idea is that you tax the least elastic consumers. And the least elastic consumer when it comes to electricity is uh, the residential sector. Even with today's prices that are extremely large, many people are not changing the way they behave. So the paper uh, had a look at this Ramsey pricing rule, which is this here. The markup that you put on prices to pay for the renewables, P minus the cost divided by the price, the markup, 
is proportional to the elasticity. So the more inelastic, you will put higher mica. This again provides support for charging the residential customers instead of the industrial customers. <coughs> However, when we have an environmental externality, the Ramsey rule does no longer hold because the whole point of putting renewables is that there is an externality. And when there is an externality, typically we want to change consumption. So this idea that we are gonna pick the Ramsey prices that distort consumption the least no longer works. We actually want to distort consumption. And indeed, what I showed in the paper is that it can even reverse the ordering and you might want to tax the most elastic sector because you want them to reduce their emissions. So in the paper, I went over this case <coughs> and you can see here that Ramsey prices when it comes to welfare are, <coughs> I'm gonna take this out because I'm gonna pass out. So uh, otherwise I will be coughing all the time, I'm sorry. So you can see that the typical Ramsey prices predict that indeed residential customers should be charged more. But you can see here that this is not necessarily better for welfare. Um, so what I showed in the paper is that if you worry about an environmental externality, Ramsey rule reverses, and we should tax more the industrial sector than the residential sector. But this is only true if the industrial sector does not leak. So what the car manufacturers were telling the German um, regulator was that, look, if you make me pay for the renewables, I'll build a power plant myself on site and I'll produce my own electricity. So that's not a true reduction of emissions. And in that sense, when there is leakage, we go back to subsidizing the industrial sector, which is most elastic, because they are not reducing their emissions anyway. And we focus more on charging the, resident, the commercial sector, which cannot build a natural gas power plant next to the office. So this is kind of a first paper, but it's kind of showing how the regulations can have distributional implications. And we want to carefully think about, OK, is there an economic theory behind it that can justify some of these transfers? What are we kind of wrong about what we are doing? Another example is this one. This is a recent paper where I look at the impact that wind power has had in Spain over the last 10 years with time series data, detailed time series data from the Spanish electricity market. By detailed, I mean hourly data. So every hour for the last 10 years. Um, <coughs> We do a pretty simple analysis in a pretty simple paper where we regress outcomes of interest on wind and we see what impact wind has had on prices, on emissions, and other elements of welfare. At the end of the day, we see who are the winners of the expansion, who are the losers. And we also look at whether this uh, balance depends on whether it's moments of a lot of wind or moments with a little, little wind. The reason is that people worry quite a bit about those days in which there is a lot of wind. At least a few years ago, there was this concern that it would be very hard to accommodate. So what we find is that consumers are better off in net, even after paying the subsidies. At least on average, the industrial consumers are the happiest. Uh, and we can see that they are particularly happy when there is a lot of wind, which is this last bar. The reason is that when there is a lot of wind, prices can even go to zero, which is very favorable to consumers. Uh, Non-wind producers are kind of the ones that are most upset. <laughs> and obviously wind farmers are better off with a policy because it enables the expansion of wind. Although this a part of this will go and cover the fixed cost of building the, the farms. So in the paper, we also explore a change in the policy that moved away from a production tax credit, it was an incentive at the margin. So the more you produce, the more subsidy we had, to one that was based only on installed capacity. So if you had a farm, you would be getting uh, a subsidy uh, independently of your production. I say independently, but it's not quite true. You had to have a certain minimum production so that you wouldn't have the whole thing switched off. But as long as you were above a minimum, you would get the subsidy. So this, uh, from a um, first order condition approach, so if we think about the first order conditions of the wind farmers, changes their problem very substantially, because all of a sudden, if uh, when you have a production tax credit, your marginal cost can even be negative, because as long as you are producing, you are getting a subsidy. 
uh, whereas if you remove that production tax credit, your marginal cost is no longer negative. So it changes quite a bit your behavior. So what we find in the paper is that it made uh, the reduction in prices much smaller, and no longer we had these very, very low prices in moments of uh, high wind. So typically in Spain before 2014, there were quite a few hours a day, not a lot, but a sizable amount where prices were zero. This also happened in Texas and Germany where prices can even be negative. But after the policy change, we no longer had these negative prices. So in the paper, we show that this was more efficient in terms of operating the grid because wind farms having negative costs is not, uh, is not, uh, it's not real that they have negative costs. But that said, it hurt consumers. Consumers no longer had these very low prices. Uh, Non-wind producers, they were very happy because they no longer had zero prices. Wind farmers, they were a bit kind of ambivalent about this because the subsidy was designed to be more or less equivalent. And in terms of total welfare, we, we find it goes up and it's in part driven by the fact that it was more efficient not to distort the marginal cost of wind, but it came with substantial transfers. So the last paper I'll talk about, and I'll talk about this with more detail. Let me see how much time I have. I have half an hour, that's good. So I'll be talking about the impacts of uh, another policy change that happened in Spain that moved consumers from a flat price to real-time pricing, which means that every hour of the day you can have a different price. This is quite unique of Spain because most countries have these tariffs available, but they are not the default tariff. They don't move everyone into this type of real-time pricing. So I'll try to put the mask again on to see if I don't choke, but I might put it back. So the, the data we have is kind of more spectacular than the previous two papers because it's not market level data, it's household level data. We have the smart meter data of millions of households in Spain for 18 months. And we will be looking there at smart meter data, which is hourly consumption of every day of the year. And we will be looking at whether uh, low income households are better off with the change compared to high income households or the other way around. The goal of the paper was to worry about energy poverty implications of moving to real time pricing. The effects that we find during this period are very small. But obviously now all of a sudden, this has become kind of very topical because we should really worry about real time pricing now and, uh, and the implications uh, on income. So uh, uh, the paper we do, as I mentioned, we examine this change in Spain that moved away from flat tariffs to real time pricing. And methodologically, the part that we're excited about is that whereas we have very good high frequency data for every household on their electricity consumption, we have so-so data on their income. In particular, we only observe the income distribution of the zip code they belong to, but we don't know their income. So we try to develop uh, empirical methods to try to better infer the income distribution of households. And this is kind of the more nerdy part of what I will uh, present today. So uh, as a preview of results, what we find is that going from annual to monthly prices is actually regressive and it can be concerning from an energy poverty point of view. The reason is that on average, low income households benefit from having insurance in prices during the year. This is relevant for today's discussion because it means that low income households might be, I'm sorry, I cannot do it. So uh, low income households might be particularly exposed to these, um, to these uh, raising prices, very expensive prices in the winter. I call this informal heating. As you might know in Spain, there are some buildings that were not even meant to have electricity. And the way that many low income households keep themselves is with things that get plugged in. This is not fancy electric heating. It's something that you bought that's probably not very efficient and that consumes quite a lot of electricity. So we find that this channel of electricity consumption can be a little bit concerning seasonally. In a more kind of narrow temporal dimension, if we think about going from flat prices to volatile prices during the day, the low income households actually benefit. And the reason is that the high income households tend to have more stuff. So they are actually consuming more at the peak. When they back home, they are turning on more things. And therefore the high income households are the ones that are worse off 
when you go from flat to moving prices <coughs> at an ROI of dimensional uh, scale. I have to highlight, however, that the, the income effects are very uh, dependent on appliance ownership. So we find a lot of heterogeneity even within an income bin. Within the low income bin, low income households generally are better off under both uh, types of changes, as long as they don't have electric heating. It's only when we have electric heating that we might worry about uh, energy, energy public implications. So uh, it's kind of um, uh, the result we have. So I will not go over the papers, probably I missed many. Uh, let me tell you a bit more about the change. So many of you are Spanish and many of you probably don't even know that this happened. But in 2015, your electricity uh, changed from having a fixed price to having uh, a price that would change every hour of the year, as long as you were on the default tariff, the regulated tariff. Um, so what happened is that the electricity price has both an energy component and an access component. And this energy price, which used to be flat, became a function of the wholesale market. So whatever the wholesale market price is, it became the energy price. This access price part has not changed um, during our sample period, but it, it is what got recently changed now in June. For those who live here, you might have heard in the news about what time you should put your washing machine or signaling your wealth by putting the washing machine at 8 p.m. So uh, that, that was a change uh, on, the access, on the access price. So in this paper, the focus is on the earlier uh, change. I hope I can study this change later. Uh, obviously, the data collection is still ongoing and it will be contaminated by many disruptions that are happening. Uh, so the data, as I mentioned, is a smart meter data for many households from one large Spanish utility. And basically, we know their every, every hour what they are consuming. Importantly, we also know their plan characteristics. It's whether they are on real-time pricing or not, which is obviously useful but also we know their contracted power, their maximum power available. This is extremely correlated with income because low income households will tend to be in lower, uh, smaller houses. And also it's quite a large part of the bill. So, so we use that as a, as a way to infer income. And on top of that, we have the postal code, which obviously is very useful to infer income. We will use the distribution of income in the postal code and try to relate these three things to come up with the best guess of what the income of every household in our data is. So this is a map of what we have. It's mostly south of Madrid and Galicia. And these are the prices during our sample period. So here I put the annual sample of prices and you can see two things. Prices in the winter tend to be more volatile. And this is driven precisely because of the price of natural gas being much more volatile in the winter and also demand being more kind of extreme. And then in the summer, it's kind of lower prices and less price volatility. So this is why the winter electric heating will be driving many of our results because this is when consumers get the most insurance. So what I will do is describe first the, the calculation of what the impact of the policy was. So this is just accounting. And then I will try to relate it to in income. Um, so for RPP impacts, uh, what we will do is assume that consumption would be the same, whether you are on a flat price or on a dynamic price. And our justification is a previous paper with Natalia and co-authors, where we show actually that consumers didn't respond to this policy change in their hourly patterns of consumption. This is again, maybe not unexpected because many people didn't even know that these things had happened. So we will be assuming that quantity is the same and therefore something that could be very complicated, which is constructing counterfactual bill. What would be your counterfactual bill? As we know in economics, that's very difficult getting at counterfactual. Here we will have a very easy counterfactual because assuming that quantity is the same, we only need to compute the bill with a fixed price or with a mobile price and compare the two. So this is the distribution and I want to emphasize that during this pre period price volatility was limited. So we do find that consumers uh, lose or win between two to four or 5% of their bill, but it's not huge impact. So in the context of our sample, in our sample of the data, 
uh, the distributional impacts are there, but they are not huge. Nowadays, we are seeing changes in bills that are way more enormous than this, and we can easily see people with 50%, 80% changes in their bills, but here the impacts were limited. So the challenge that we have, which is where we try to make it fun from a more academic point of view, is the fact that we don't know income at the household level. And for those of you who live here, but this is similar to US zip code, and I imagine also a zip code in many other uh, countries, within a zip code, there's still a lot of heterogeneity. So if I take two people from the same zip code, it might not be a very good guess to assume that they have the same distribution of income. So what we will do is try to use the detailed smart meter data to come up with a better guess of the income of households. This is done in taxation, for example. If you see someone buying a Ferrari and they declare that their income is 10,000 euros a year, you go and investigate that person. Uh, it's also done in crime enforcement using electricity data. So more and more the police are using smart meter data. Be careful what you do. Because uh, with a smart meter data, it's pretty easy to, to find out that someone is producing some sort of illegal drugs, for example. Not going so breaking bad uh, in the line of uh, examples. It's also used to um, identify illegal businesses. This could be something very simple, like an illegal hairdresser. But it will be quite noticeable in the smart meter data that you actually are running a business at home, if it's kind of energy intensive. It can also be a bakery or other things that you don't declare. So the idea here will be to use the same data uh, to come up with, again with a better guess, but we will not be as precise as identifying that someone is running an illegal business. Um, so I will put some notation to pick the idea. So we have the zip codes and we have the income bins. So this is how our income data comes. For every income bin, think of a national quintile. We know the share of people in a given zip code that uh, are in that quintile. For example, I could know that in Badalona, there's 25% of people in the second quintile uh, of, of income. Um, that's the data we will have. So we observe the probability that a given household in a given zip code belongs to one of these quintiles. Uh, what we don't know and we would love to know is the actual distribution of income for every household. So what's the probability that the ID 1.354 has an income of 30,000 euros, and this is what we will try to better guess. Obviously, this is not identified, so we will try to come up with a, a, better, a better guess. So a naive approach would be what I was saying. It's kind of assigning the income distribution at the zip code level to everyone in that zip code. But this could be quite unsatisfactory because you miss many of the income effects that might be going on within a zip code. So we will, it kind of very much captures accurately across zip codes heterogeneity, but you miss whatever is happening inside the zip code. So this is what we will try to improve. So the way we do it is by using some of these tools that now are being uh, developed, which is uh, using discrete types of heterogeneity and combining this with machine learning to try to uh, come up with a better classification. Uh, for those of you who follow a very brilliant uh, economist from Spain, Elena Manres, I'm sure many of you know, she's working with many of these tools. So this is kind of inspired by, by this kind of empirical econometric method. So we will have these discrete types. And the nice thing about discrete types is that instead of worrying about identifying the probability that each household has a given income, which I already told you is not identified, we can reduce the dimension of our problem to identifying the distribution of income of these different types that we have simplified greatly. So um, the identification and the estimator, the way it works is that we will classify consumers into these kind of discrete heterogeneous classes and then we will infer the income distribution of these types, which is much, much smaller in dimension, as I was mentioning. We still need some moments to identify this distribution of income, and it's coming from the different zip codes. So the key will be to allow for sufficient discrete heterogeneity so that we can match the distribution of income well, but not too much income, uh, not, not too much heterogeneity so that it's still identified. Our identifying assumption will be that if we have two zip codes that are next to each other, some of these types are shared. 
So if I go to a zip code, I don't know, in Saria, and then I go to San Gervasi, um, we hope that we know that people in Saria and San Gervasi are different, but we hope that some people in Saria and San Gervasi are the same. So that's kind of the assumption. So it's much better in a graph or in a kind of a sketch. So imagine we have two zip codes, one and two, and we assume that the types are shared. And now we try to classify people together for those two zip codes. And we find that allowing for two types, we find that zip code one has much more people of type E and zip code two has more uh, people of type uh, B. So imagine zip code one and two are kind of similar, but zip code one is higher income. This will help us conclude that type A should have a distribution of income that's kind of higher than type B. And this is kind of the intuition behind the identification. Um, in practice, this is just identified and it's solving this system of equations. And as long as this kind of a nice system of equations, we get these two numbers. In practice, we cannot perfectly match these different moments. So it will be more constrained uh, GMM where we basically minimize the departures of, of how we fit the data. And in this estimation, we are trying to infer, again, the probability of income of these different types. The probability that in a given zip code, we have these different types, we have done this in a first step. In a first step, we have classified people in these two types A and type B. We do constrain the distribution of income to be an actual distribution of income. So it adds up to, to one. So this is kind of the method. Obviously, a lot goes into this uh, magic kind of uh, recipe. And the key or one thing that's very important is how we classify households. So I told you we pull together some zip codes and then we try to classify people into different types. There are many things that, there are many ways in which you could do this. So a goal in the paper is to try to see, okay, how can we make sure that our results are robust? We try different things. I am not sure, or at least we haven't figured out, Natalia is over there, you can ask her. <laughs> I don't think we have figured out uh, if there's any way that's better or worse from a more theoretical point of view. So this is more kind of a practical application, but we do try to make sure that the results are not too sensitive to the way we classify consumers. One very easy way of classifying consumers is contracted power. We know how much people are contracting at home. This is the maximum power that you can have at home. As you know, it might be five kilowatts, six kilowatts, or maybe 10 if you have a lot of electricity. So this is observable at the household level. So this is very useful, very detailed household level information. This we always use. On top of that, we do several other things that are kind of a bit more related to machine learning techniques. So we use machine learning techniques with a, a smart meter data to infer whether someone has a heating or whether someone has air conditioning. And we use that to classify people because probably AC ownership is correlated with income um, and heating as well. We also do some deterministic classification based on kind of uh, aggregate moments from the smart meter data. We also use expected maximization algorithms to classify them. And we also have uh, done K-means clustering. Today's approach is based on K-means clustering, which is the closest to easy literature by Elena Manresa that they was uh, mentioned. So for the K-means clustering approach, we still have to reduce the data. We have so much data for every household that we cannot just cluster people on the unfiltered raw smart meter data. So we create moments of the smart meter data and then we cluster people. Basically, it will cluster people into, is this a professional that's away from home the whole day? Or is this someone who's at home during the day and therefore turns things on during the day? Or is this someone who has an AC and therefore consumes during the summer when it's hot? So this is kind of what the algorithm will be trying to do. We do check from a theoretical point of view, as I mentioned, there's no reason to do one uh, way or the other, but we do show with Monte Carlos that the method is working if the assumptions that we have made are, are valid. Uh, on a GMM approach, it's very simple. It's the optimization that I already showed you because we have already classified people into types, then it's just solving that system of equations. So once we have this, uh, we, we can get the income at the household level. It is not the real income. It's kind of a better guess of what the income distribution of a household is. So it is still a probabilistic statement. 
but uh, we do some sanity checks to make sure that we are not just um, getting things that are not plausible. So one first check is looking whether people with low contracted power have lower income than people with high contracted power. And as he already mentioned, this is very correlated with income. And we do find indeed that people with low contracted power are classified into having much lower income, even conditional on being on the same zip code. And this is where the approach becomes valuable, that now I can take people in the same zip code before I was saying that they have the same distribution of income. And now I can say, no, even within this zip code, this person has lower contracted power, probabilistically, they have lower income. We also check uh, what happens to their patterns of consumption. And we do find that the consumers who have higher income are classified into the, are more picky. This means that they are consuming in the, more in the evening. They are turning more things on, which is uh, intuitive. So now we go back to the impacts of RTP. So who are the winners and who are the losers? Now that we have classified people into these different income bins a bit better. Uh, so what we do is look at their impacts on the bill and we compare the naive approach, which is forgetting about uh, zip code heterogeneity to, the, uh, to this method with heterogeneity. And, do, and we do find that the impact of the policy are relatively small, but we do find that the shape changes. So if we take into account income heterogeneity, we do find that some low-income households end up paying more. We, meet, we would miss that if we used the naive approach. I will tell more about what the mechanisms are behind this finding. Uh, I do have time. I also want to highlight that even with this better classification, there is a lot of unexplained heterogeneity within income bin. So this basically means that the impacts of the electricity price on households depends on income, but also depends quite heavily on appliance ownership. Uh, so here we can see that in the first quintile, the red one, some people win, they pay fewer uh, every month, and some people lose, they pay much more. Uh, whereas in each of the quintiles, we do have a similar thing. What's driving our results in the aggregate is that within the first quintile, there's this kind of right tail of people who end up paying quite more when compared to other quintiles. And this is again, the ones that we identify as having electric heating. And again, in my mind, it's this form of informal electric heating. So decomposing the price variation we find is very important and that I highlighted in the summary of results. The results that I showed so far are going from annual prices to prices that change every hour. And it can hurt the low income households especially if they increase their consumption quite a bit during the winter. Uh, however, uh, if we think about going from monthly to daily prices, then the, the low income are actually better off. So in this figure, I show you the cross month effect, and we can see that, that the effect is regressive, low income households, because there are uh, a segment of them that consume much more in the winter, they are worked off with the change. However, if we go from month to daily, uh, they are they are better off. So in some ways, going from real time prices, going from flat prices to real time prices, whether it's regressive or it's progressive, it, it will depend quite a bit on whether the flat prices are insuring the low income households during uh, winter events, like the ones we are seeing uh, this summer, at uh, this winter. So we look a bit more about the mechanisms behind the patterns. So when it comes to the monthly patterns, we can see that uh, the fifth quintile consumes much more during peak. Again, they have way more many appliances and disproportionately more. So this is why they end up uh, worse off uh, if we go from monthly to daily prices. Low income, we uh, estimate them to have lower consumption on average, which makes sense. And we also uh, estimate them to consume disproportionately at night. <laughs> So this is again saying that real-time prices can be good for the low income because they consume at night. So what happens seasonally, however, is that a big driver of the impacts is uh, a client's ownership. We can see that people with heating or AC, they are worse off. Uh, the, the ones with heating, they are worse off during the winter. Uh, and we can see it here. And the ones with AC are worse off during the summer. So this appliance ownership is uh, quite impactful on the impacts and actually does not perfectly correlate with income. 
geography is another thing that explains very much uh, um, appliance ownership. And there are certain parts of the country where buildings only rely on informal heating, whereas there are other parts of the country where heating is more necessary and it might be more embedded into the building uh, construction. Think about Barcelona city. It's very different from the, the Las Comarcas, the counties, because in the counties you do need heating, but Barcelona is so warm that many, many buildings don't have electricity. Uh, so I'm coming from Chicago, okay? So Barcelona is very warm. <laughs> yes. uh, so here uh, we can see the heterogeneity across provinces, and we do see that uh, the hourly patterns are very uh, independent from appliance ownership because low-income people have less and they consume less at peak times. So if we think about going from a flat price during the day to a price that's higher during the day, this will tend to benefit the low income. However, when you go to the seasonal impacts, you can see that they are actually quite different depending on the region. And we do estimate that some regions uh, are regressive and Madrid is the largest uh, zip codes. So it's what's driving the aggregate pattern. But in some regions, we don't find a clear pattern or it's even progressive. Castilla y León, I was very surprised, but it does have a very limited electric heating. And it might be precisely for what I was saying that Castilla y León is pretty, pretty cold. So uh, buildings might be already prepared with other uh, ways of heating. So in the paper, we uh, are exploring several counterfactuals. I will not present them today, unfortunately, because they are not quite ready. But it, it took us a little bit by surprise, this energy crisis we're seeing today. But we are using the model we have and the data we have to look at wild counterfactuals that are definitely not in our sample when we have these huge natural gas prices, see what's happening to consumers. And we basically confirm what we said, the biggest driver of energy poverty is whether you are relying on informal heating, and that can be a big deal. It's not all of the low income, but something to pay attention to. So I think I'm, I'm early, I am early. <laughs> I went very quickly. So this is everything I wanted to present. Uh, it's kind of a line of research to try to think about the impacts of the energy transition. From a methodological point of view, I like to put kind of machine learning, whatever I can find. But at the broader level, I do think theory, empirics, everything needs to come together to solve these, to solve these challenges. Let's go mark the phone. Just please raise your hand and get the microphone. <laughs> okay, um, I think I'm gonna move a little bit outside of your presentation, but it's a, it's a question that I've been reading about, so I'm interested in seeing your views. You mentioned the issue of the unreliability of, of renewables and um, some, I've seen some proponents of going back to relying more nuclear power as an alternative that is reliable and steady and does not generate uh, so much of a carbon footprint and so on. And given that you are an expert, I wanted to hear your views on that particular topic, if you want to. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I don't need the mic. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a good question. One of the papers I presented, I didn't highlight it, but we do measure the impact of wind on what is called uh, in electricity reliability services, backup, stuff happening. And we do find indeed that the more wind you put on the grid, the higher these costs. But it's not like end of the world difficult. That said, it's true that as of today, we are not ready to cover the demand with renewables. And even though in Spain, we have quite a bit of solar, quite a bit of wind, at some point, some days, there is no wind and there is no solar. So that's a bit of a bigger concern than, than this intermittency that people thought was a big deal. 
the big deal is that some days there's no sun <laughs> and some days there's no wind. So what do you do then? Um, so my, my perception of uh, things is that the costs of technologies are changing extremely rapidly. And nuclear is not getting any cheaper. It's extremely uncertain. And yes, it doesn't have CO2, but it has many other things that come with it, hot potatoes. So going from one hot potato to another, maybe not. When we compare even estimates of today of what they are paying to the nuclear, new nuclear power plants that they are building in the UK, when, when we compare that to newer uh, solutions of combining renewables with a storage, I just don't see a real competition. Renewables and storage seems much cheaper and also much more certain. So we need to decarbonize the grid and we need to decarbonize it fast. So putting all the eggs in a basket, that's maybe praying that maybe in 15 years, there will be this nuclear that will actually work when we haven't built a nuclear power plant in I don't know how many years. And any nuclear power plant that we have tried to build, it came with huge cost overruns and massive delays. We cannot delay much. So uh, maybe I'm not gonna go Greta Thunberg on you, but we really cannot delay much. I'm putting all the eggs in a basket that maybe comes in 15 years and that comes with a variety of other problems when the cost that they are selling it for is getting very close to what renewables and storage can provide. I just don't see it. So my sense is that we want to keep some human capital on what nuclear technology is. And definitely you don't, we don't want that human capital to disappear. And there has to be ways to provide incentives so that the human capital remains in some ways. But I would not build it. I would definitely not build it, yeah. Even, even without worrying about nuclear waste, which is a whole hot potato, but I'm not even putting that hot potato in the, in the cost benefit, yeah. Which we should, okay? But I'm not even putting that hot potato, yes. Natalia might disagree, agree, I don't know. <laughs> fully agree, fully agree. Uh, I guess I should not be the one saying this, but it was an absolutely fascinating uh, lecture. I'm so glad to know that uh, probably many people here and outside there will be joining the field. So thank you very much uh, for the contribution. I just have a very small comment on the first project uh, where you talk about the welfare and the distributional implications of moving from production tariffs to uh, uh, capacity or investment tariffs. I was wondering whether uh, you take into account what I would say is a first order effect, which has to do on, on the location of the investment. So if you pay for production, investors would yeah. tend to locate in those places where there's a lot of sun or a lot of wind because they want to maximize production. But if you pay for investment, uh, regardless of production, then they cannot care less where they locate, which is a major determinant on, of the efficiency of those investments. So I was wondering whether you just take into account the effects given the locations or whether you also endogenize location decisions. So this is a super good question. And there are some papers in the United States that exploit differences in time with investment tax credits and production tax credits to look at the, at the location impact. So this policy for Spain was uh, in some ways retroactive. As you know, Spain can royal decree something and then they change the rules. So they kind of royal decree the existing, uh, the, the existing wind farms. At that moment, which was 2014, 2015, there, there was no, no subsidy in place uh, for new investments. So in some ways, it's, it's only about this incentive at the margin. What I was a bit surprised is that we couldn't uh, find a, a disincentive to production. So uh, I showed you that uh, prices no longer went to zero. And I thought that a lot of it would be throwing away wind. So instead of using your wind, you prevent wind from dumping prices. This would be very natural. We found this was extremely second order. We couldn't, we couldn't measure it. It might be a bit particular of this time period. And nowadays the incentive to not dump wind is huge. <laughs> Why would you put a price of zero if you can get a 300? Okay, so nowadays I'm sure there is a huge incentive to dump wind. But during that period, the prices were quite small anyway. So we don't, we don't see this effect that I thought was a disincentive to not location, but to production in general. We, we don't find it, but it, it is interesting. Yes, thank you.
Yeah, no, I think it will come naturally. So one way in which, but not during the sample period. During the sample period, we actually have people on the EV type and we dropped them because we had maybe like, I'm being a bit extreme, but literally 10 people in the 4 million sample. So it, 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 the, the technology was not quite there. Batteries are not quite, um, not quite there, uh, but they are there if you think about the resilience that they provide. So in California, many people are putting the batteries, not only because they can arbitrage prices, but because it protects them when the grid fails. And in markets like Texas or California, like in Texas, it's kind of a, one of the high ticket items for this uh, holiday season. People want a battery. It's not cost effective just for the arbitrage, but it protects you when the grid fails. And obviously, Santa Claus is only being good to the high income, okay? Going back to the theme. So, so I do think that you still need this resilience to justify it, but it's coming down very quickly. So I, I, I was working on putting solar panels in my community and uh, the sellers were very honest because I was like, okay, can you give me numbers for battery storage? And they're like, look, I will put you a system that in two, three years you can put the storage because nowadays it's not quite cost effective, but it will be there. Um, electric vehicles themselves are a battery. The challenge is that manufacturers so far uh, have been preventing uh, putting electricity back into the grid from the EV because obviously it has fair and wear implications. So for the warranties and the life of the battery, they don't want to mess up with it. But this, uh, it might have changed already. Last time I checked, it is obviously possible to discharge an electric vehicle, but it was not allowed. But it might already be allowed because things are changing very quickly. Again, the high income will be the ones with that electric vehicle plugged at home, but, but, but it will definitely happen, yes. Actually, this is something we're exploring with Natalia in our paper. We have some counterfactuals of thinking in our model, in our quantification, it's really accounting. We assumed people didn't do anything. They didn't change their behavior because they truly did not. But we do some counterfactuals thinking about the future. And we think a very interesting aspect is whether we think high income households are more or less elastic. Obviously, our first intuition from other goods is that the low income are more elastic. If you increase the price, the low income are the ones that will consume more. And that's true in levels. If we increase prices during this winter, the low income are the ones that will suffer and are also the ones that will not be able to heat their homes. But if we think about the high frequency, at the high frequency, it's going to be probably the high income that are more elastic, not because they care about it, but because their gadgets and, and their home is kind of doing it for them. Yeah. And we have these counterfactuals there. Yeah. Uh, the, this is a very naive question from someone who is totally ignorant in this topic, but is there a way to improve upon marginal cost pricing in wholesale electricity markets? I mean, it's created a lot of social alarm uh, with the cost of gas uh, prices and so on. What will be your opinion? Yes, this is a very good question. Uh, I don't think it would take another hour to get a uh, properly answer. So I think the, the marginal cost of electricity, it's, it's whatever it is it is burning natural gas. That's a, the marginal cost and it is very high. Another question is, should we pay that price for everything we consume? And obviously the answer is no. Industrial manufacturers are not paying 300 for everything. Actually, many industrial manufacturers have pushed with the regulator to make it easier to cover their demand with solar panels because solar panels at the industrial level are $30 a megawatt hour. So why would you be paying 300 for all of your consumption when it costs 30? The key is to worry about, uh, so this is kind of very pervasive. And I, I have to say, I don't think it was done in bad faith, but the households who have the social tariff are by law into the real time pricing tariff. So by law, they are the ones who are paying 300 for everything. 
what we need to do is work on people so that they can pay the 30. Now at home, it's not 30 euros per megawatt hours because a rooftop is more limited. You need an inverter, but you just have a few uh, panels or whatever, but it's still way cheaper than 300. So we need to work on uh, allowing for community solar on top of all the solar that we can get and kind of make it easier for households to, to, to put these things in place to protect themselves against these high, high prices. In a very well-functioning retailing market, um, we could see um, retailers competing more on that margin. As a retailer, my cost is not 300. As a retailer, I might have solar panels or a, a long-term contract with solar panels and our other providers. So, so it could be that they compete a little bit to offer something cheaper than 300, let's say. But as we know from other work, uh, it's not the healthiest market in terms of competition retailing. It's super difficult. And actually these very high prices are making it very hard for some of these uh, companies to survive. In the UK, I think we have now 12, 13 companies that have already gone bankrupt. So it's not a very healthy competitive market. So a lot of it might come from these community solar initiatives where you more directly participate in them. The problem is that when we talk about more directly participating, it's gonna be the high income. So that's the, I think a margin that, that we need to worry about, yeah. Right. Thank you, thank you.